Namaste and welcome to Future Leaders produced by Today's Youth Asia. In this show, we discuss visionary ideas, talk about innovation, inspire youth leadership and nurture concerns for a better world. My name is Janesha and today we have the privilege of having with us Mr. Kame Lakai, the founder and CEO of Global Academy of Tourism and Hospitality Education. Mr. Lakai is also a certified hospitality educator and has gathered over 16 years of experience, including stints in Europe, North America, and Asia. He has a degree in commerce and also graduated with a degree in hotel management from the Swiss School of Tourism and Hospitality in Switzerland. We also have with us my co-host, Mr. Santos Shah, the president of Today's Youth Asia. He is also an inspirational figure for many youths like me. In today's episode, what we are trying to cover is how can service industry affect uh, the young people's life? How can young people take service industry as a serious career? And how can the society welcome the young people entering into service sector as a dignified job? Service sector has always been a dignified job until in recent century where we categorized the job skill based on money and respect. Long time ago there was a society where everybody was equally needed for a balanced society. Then in last uh, five decades I would say people said that if you're a doctor then you make the most money and you get the best respect and uh, Everybody's parents wanted the children to be a doctor, not just in Nepal, but in other parts of the world. We need doctors in the society, but having doctors alone is not going to solve all the problems or, or cater to all the needs of the population in a society. I mean, imagine if nobody cooks in the villas or in a city. I mean, before doctor, you need food. And if uh, you didn't have workers to uh, build the road, no matter how expert engineers you had, that wouldn't really matter. And it's a different thing, everybody wants to be paid high. But who says that service industry does not have good income? If you look at the master chef and big hotels all over the world, they probably make more money than any doctor or engineers. Uh, look at the design, fashion designers, that's also a service industry. Uh, the hoteling business is one of the most expensive business all over the world. And tourism is one of the highest paid uh, money income generating sector in the world. And it's, it, the work also comes with a lot of uh, entertainment and having a nice life. So there are a lot of uh, job space uh, available, but disregarded because we level the, the job skill. And at a time, at a century when youth unemployment is a huge issue, I think uh, discussing about service sectors, job placements and service sector careers is the need of today's time. And that's why we have with us Mr. Kim Lakai, who is an expert in this field and not just an expert, he's an exemplary figure himself in this sector because he's practiced what he's going to say today. So we are, we'll, we're going to listen to him and we're going to take your questions. Thank you for having me. Um, I think uh, Mr. Sa is right because um, the hospitality industry, service sector in large, is the largest and fastest growing industry in the world that generates the most jobs. And very few people are aware in Nepal. Uh, and uh, not many young people were attracted in the past to this profession because uh, it didn't fit into one of those categories that makes um, top jobs in the country. This trend is growing um, and the need of young professionals getting into uh, proper hospitality education service sector is something that will help our nation, uh, A, for getting jobs and getting other people, uh, provide other people uh, with the opportunity of employment. I mean, you could be self-entrepreneur with the training and education and you could also work at home and abroad, both. And we often talk about the importance of tourism and hospitality industry in Nepal being one of the top tourist destinations. But how can we achieve that? How can we achieve this financial freedom 
using this uh, almost 75% of the youth population, which is now liability to the country, it seems like, which is in fact asset if it is rightly used. So which is why uh, we thought that this discussion would uh, you know, create this platform for young uh, students like you to ask whatever question you have. Thank you. Service industry, uh, hospitality, can you call it? is not regarded as so much of a promising career in Nepal. Uh, usually people often refer to doctors and engineers as promising careers. And why do you think this is happening? The answer to your question is that um, how many times we go to doctor? But again, how many times do we need to eat? You know, and uh, how many times we travel in our life? Uh, if you just think of a small example, if you go to Pokhara, uh, who all provide you services? A, either you fly, B, inside the airlines, who is, who is going to serve you? Second, where are you going to stay? Where are you going to eat? Uh, where are you going to places from A to B? All these things in the service sector. You know, tourism is not just, and not, people, not many people have realized this. The first question I get from young students who are aspiring, who wanted to get into the sector, I ask why, and they say, this is a scope. And a scope is a vague thing. A scope, there's nearly good scope for everything if you do it right. So the whole point is, we have to do it right. A scope That's is right. always changing with time also. It does. A scope, a scope always changes. Uh, for, for instance, the past uh, one decade in our country, uh, it's a war-torn country. Not many people wanted to return back, you know. I mean, and now we are gradually heading to the peace process and probably this will generate uh, a lot of tourist arrival. But again, can we retain this? Can we compete with the rest of the world is our next challenge. Could you tell us how you manage business and uh, social work simultaneously? I think business and social two different things. And then being a business uh, entrepreneur, you can also take care of the social part. That's my thing. Because the management teaches you how to do the things right way. Whereas if you are a social entrepreneur and if you are a social part, how to do the right thing. These are two, two different things. And uh, uh, you have to balance this both. So you, uh, uh, to become successful, a multi business is what? You multiply uh, um, wealth, you multiply business, your business has a growth, that is one part. But at the same time, how socially responsible you are. Uh, what is your business, uh, whether your business is making impact in the society is another thing. And to impact in the society, you have to do the right thing. So these are the two different things uh, I probably think is the best that I, I practice. Now, see, what happens is while you're having your food, you also need to drink water you know, to, have, to have a balance. And for those who think making money alone and running the business alone is going to take them to a different level, then I think it may take you there, but it's not going to be sustainable because there's no balance to it. And if somebody who thinks, I'm only going to do social work all the time, there's also not much balance because for the financial reason, you're going to have to rely on somebody else. So if you are involved in business, involving yourself in social work should be, very com should be complementary. You should somehow figure out uh, within yourself to create time and X percentage of your income in the giving to charity or doing the social work yourself even, which is better. And you don't, again, have to take photographs and, you know, get praises for that. That should be more for your own personal satisfaction if business is your main sector because your success would be in getting the business uh, successful. Now, if you are more inclined towards social, sec social work, then you may be recognized as a social leader. But at the same time, you have to yourself figure out a way to take care of your own expenses. Just now, Mr. Saad talked about corporate social responsibilities. So what have been your efforts to achieve the corporate social responsibilities? I think um, being socially responsible, uh, there are two folds to it. One is uh, being individual, uh, taking care of the individual responsibility. Then when you run a business, then you have certain business responsibility, corporate responsibility that we can uh, talk about. For instance, our students, we encourage them to go out in the street to role model and to say that uh, we, we live in this community and we, we like to be in the safe community, uh, which is clean.
So uh, how can we do it? We do it by ourselves. We go once in the street and then we clean the street. It doesn't mean that we're replacing this cleaning job, but we're telling the rest of the people that, look, I can come and clean your yard. Why can't you do it? That was the message. For example, we initiated this food safety thing uh, all over Valley now, and it is going beyond Valley. So it's everybody's... Uh, uh, concern now. I mean, you must have been seen, uh, you know, following the news that um, a lot of shops, adulterated food, and which is unsafe, everything, everywhere people know about it. But then going and raiding those shops is one thing. But who is going to educate these people that what is the right way of doing things? And then we as a, um, a hotel school, we did this from our part because we thought that um, the government goes and raids and shuts down the shop. It's not going to be the permanent solution. That is just awareness. But then how can we educate? Uh, how can you create thousands of jobs which can educate these people how to do the right thing and at the same time creating jobs? I think that again falls under the social, corporate social responsibility. We invite uh, experts from all around the world. We have the Canadian experts who is coming to teach us how, how they do it in the other part of the world. Uh, we have brought uh, experts from Dubai. We have brought experts from all over, from Lebanon, you just name it. But why do we do this? Because these people have already applied what needs to be done. And what we are doing is that with their help, we are applying the same thing. We are spreading the knowledge. And that is part of the corporate social responsibility. What would you suggest to those youth who wish to follow your footsteps? Not only Nepalese youth, but youth all over the world has one challenge, that is how to leave comfort zone. People are choosing to walk the path that somebody has already chosen. That doesn't make you leader. What leader does is leader walks the path that nobody has walked and they leave the footprint. So meaning, being able to take the challenge is first thing. And uh, taking challenge is not easy. I mean, it's uh, always difficult, and you have to role model. Uh, you have to believe something, and you have to do it. And in service sector, you start growing organically step at a time. And you begin with really hard work, hard work and hard work, right? And then service industry is something that uh, if you fly aircraft, you know what do they do? They show you every time. It doesn't matter you have, uh, you have uh, already taken flight for a hundred times. They still show you like how to, how to buckle your seat belt and what happens when you go and what happens in, if in case there is accident. They walk around with the manual. But have you seen any hospitality professionals in the hotel? Do they have manual to look? What do I do? They use sense. And that is the most, uh, most uh, important thing in, the, uh, in this hospitality sector. You are dealing with the people, the real people, okay? And to deal with the real people, you have to use your sense, you have to use your humanity, you have to be honest, otherwise that other part of the people is going to see that. You're, no, you're not being honest, you know? So staying honest, believing in your dream, and keep believing and keep walking, keep moving forward is the... Uh, right thing, what I did and what I suggest. And if you look at uh, the society, they ultimately care how much you're making, and of course legally, and not illegally, legally, uh, and also what respects you are. And being in the, in the tourism sector, first of all, you're dealing with citizens from all over the world. And if you are placed in an in a upscale tourism sector, you're dealing with pretty high-profile people from all over the world. Like, and it gives you prestige. Maybe how, I don't know how you can relate that, translate that in your local circle here, but when you get high, high profile guests from abroad, at least when you travel to their countries, even though you are, a, you could be a trekking guide in Nepal, you would be welcomed by some high profile figures in their particular country. That's a lot of respect. And again, as I said, I still don't know how to translate that uh, locally here because I'm still struggling with that. Second is, uh, I think some of the five-star hotels make more money than big hospitals. Uh, it's a very uh, high spending uh, sector. Uh, it's very expensive to get the license to climb a, climb a mountain. And uh, mountain uh, climber guides are one of the very highest paid 
people in the in the tourism sector. So it's again a myth that if you enter into the service sector, you're not paid well. Yes, 50 years ago we were not paid well because, as I said, we had feudal culture where people were not paid at all. But then, you know, you didn't make money in many sectors. Uh, we used to have these bidders, the old doctors. They didn't make much money back then. So there were not many jobs that paid you well. Uh, let's look at uh, something that is called tailoring and in, uh, in uh, the local culture, it's not considered well. But if you look at uh, countries from the West, fashion designers are one of the highest paid and having a very fancy, glamorous lifestyle people. And uh, the same clothes from a regular market would be not much expensive and the same thing if it comes from a designer is a very high priced. So, so we really can say that you know, there is no money and respect. Uh, it will take for Nepal to catch up with that, but the world is already catching out a lot on that. So it also depends uh, with whom you are going to work, where you are going to work, and uh, as like Mr. Kim is trying to set up the example by bringing international quality hospital education in hospitality education in. He's trying to set up an example by bringing international status of hospitality education in Nepal. In the future, if you want to enter into any service-oriented field and say, I'm going to bring that change and that realization in the country, then you have, it looks like you have the risk of being the first person to do that, but also look at the opportunity that you're going to come up with. Because you're going to be the first person and probably if there is, if a larger economy boosts out of it, you are going to be the one who is going to get the most out of it. I tried that with English media and I see that already uh, fruiting now, um, although it took 10 years. May I add one more thing to your question? I think uh, in Nepal, uh, the tourism product or anything that we do here, including democracy, it has to be homegrown. We can take a model and example. What I see nowadays is that people doing even the architecture. I was up in Mustang, let's say for example. Mustang has a tradition of like their patched roof with the wooden wood stock and things that is traditional houses. But then I already saw a lot of people are beginning to copy the model of these Kathmandu houses. Total garbage, I'm, I'm sorry to say that. It doesn't appeal to anybody. The modern building. The modern building, so called. But if some tourists come to Nepal and they want to go to Mustang, they don't want to go this Kathmandu looking building. It will just ruin that place. Similarly, even in Kathmandu, when you do this, we have to respect that what is we call it uh, geotourism. This is the concept. Geotourism is something that is original to that place, has to stay as it is. We cannot compete with the West and uh, and build towers that is 100 stories. We, we should not even think about it. Exactly, Bhaktapur, uh, Bandipur, that is preserved now. A lot of uh, other part of Nepal that is still keeping. But rest of the place, they are thinking that what is modern, the concept. Tourists are not going to like it. And uh, uh, for that reason, keeping, retaining your originality, one thing most important for tourism. And second thing is that um, when tourists come to this country, you know, uh, it takes, it's, it's the statistics, five to eight times more effort to bring new tourists, uh, to get new tourists interested, rather than bringing them back, it requires very small effort. But 68% of the, it is a statistic, 68% of the tourists uh, do not return because they were disappointed, and these disappointments are very preventable, preventable, meaning that may have been the service that you have given. They are not going to complain about what your hotel lacked, but hospitality that is original to us, which we don't provide, they, what they expect before coming to Nepal. If they don't get it, they, will, they are disappointed. So you see the 68% of the tourists will come back again or highly likely to recommend at least other 10 tourists, it says, if you treat them right. So see the point, if you want to bring in more tourists to this country, you don't have to advertise, enough people know about Nepal. It's just you treat them right, who are here, is that will lead to more tourist arrivals. The government of Nepal declared 2011 as the official tourism year, and we witnessed a grand opening with people excited about the event. But there's significantly, um, 
there hasn't been much change since the Tuesday May of 1998. Um, as you see, it's, it, uh, the feedback is quite disappointing. Uh, what do you think went wrong? There's a saying that if you, if you are not planning, you're planning to fail. So the planning is most important of, uh, um, in our country, of, of course, that uh, the past decades was um, really, really harmful for the tourism because of our um, political unrest and all these things. So the focus once again, if the 68% of the tourists are going to return or recommend at least 10 times more tourists, where your focus should be? Focus should be in-house. But what I saw, quite honestly, is that um, uh, in one of the five-star hotels, during this time, uh, I was there with a the guest, and a server was serving coffee with a black ribbon on, on, on his arms. You know, what is this black ribbon in our culture? It means I'm unhappy. I'm protesting. Okay? So, what happens, like, if you spend ten times more money to same cup of coffee, and you are being served by unhappy person? Do I... Are you going to be happy? Are you going to refer other people? So to prevent such things from happening, what is it? Do you have to go to Germany or do you have to advertise in America? No, you have to address your problem inside the house. If our garbage stinks, who is responsible? Are you going to advertise this in New York City? Or you, you just clean the garbage? Uh, these are internal problems, domestic problems. And our focus should have been what is going wrong in our country, within the country? What is not functioning? Are we uh, putting our effort to make sure that uh, tourists going to Pokhara makes a safe journey despite we have a, a different kind of uh, protest or whatever it is? So we did not give priority to uh, you know, domestic uh, arrangements. Rather, we always thought that we did not um, do enough marketing abroad. So which is why, I mean, it doesn't come as a surprise. If you did not plan and if your focus is not right, then your result is not going to be right. There is this universal saying that you achieve what you intend to. So if the intention is, okay, Nepal government has a budget to spend, to promote itself, to invite tourists from all over the world, and if that's the intention to spend the money, of course you will be successful in spending the money, not necessarily in achieving what the project is intended to. And that we saw successfully happening this year. Uh, second is, does Nepal really need to promote its tourism? Does not the whole world know that Buddha was born in Nepal and we still have Lumini intact? Does not the whole world know that Mount Everest, the, the highest peak of the world, is in Nepal and you, can, you have to come here to climb it? Does not the world know that we have the highest Himalayas and we are the best destination of tourism, uh, except during the civil war time. So the whole world knows it, and we don't have to tell it ten times. And if we have to tell it, we should tell it every year, not in 1998 and again in 2011, and maybe in 2022. So if we really have to tell it, we have to tell it every year. Otherwise, we don't have to tell it at all. But rather, that investment should go into training young people in the villages, to prepare them to be able to host the tourists that come from all over the world. That's where the money is required to be spent. Not in some foreign television channel, not in some international press. I don't see how that's going to relate to Nepal's tourism development. But if the money goes into the villages which, uh, through which the trekking routes pass, A, we are going to, we are going to prevent human trafficking to a great extent. And it's a, it's a subject of same that our own citizens have to sell our own citizens for some money, whereas that can be easily prevented by the funds that goes into tourism promotions, into training the young women in the villages about how to start their own tea shop, how to brew a coffee, how to prepare organic salad. It's very easy, it's not very difficult. How to create a homestay in the villages. We don't have to put a few million dollars of big hotels. I think any visitor from any part of the world would like to have homestay in the mountains. Hotels, trust me, there are fantastic hotels all over the world. We can never compete. Maybe in the next 50 years, we, after 50 years we can. But with little investments, I don't think we can compete. 
the global uh, uh, hospitality sector. But when it comes to home hospitality, we can compete any country today because we as Nepali citizens, we are very hospitable. We are very warm people. Uh, we have natural smile. And these are the best assets for organic tourism. And the, the soil in the mountains are very organic. To, to cater organic salads, freshly grown, even the, the tourists can go and pluck the vegetables themselves. These are very easy things to achieve. So it doesn't require uh, you know, a master's degree or a knowledge of Newton's law or Einstein's law. It's very, it's very basic, simple thing. Second thing is a lot of young people, the, especially the male, are leaving Nepal to get labor jobs in 50 degrees centigrade in Arab countries. They may be coming from mountains which has 5 degrees centigrade. Just imagine what they go through. There are certain villages that are devoid of youth population. All the young people are working abroad. How much money do they send back home? Three to 5,000 rupees per month if they're lucky. That's an, that's an amount you can earn from a tea shop in one day in any trekking route in, in, in the mountains. And any number of uh, tea shops in the mountains would sell well. And so, so that's where our focus should be. We should right now invest into our own people. And we, we are not capable, of, capable enough today to invest into foreign media advertising. I mean, maybe in 50 years when we are extremely rich, we can afford to do that. And if we are spending that kind of money at the cost of some village women getting trafficked and some male villagers being, having to go abroad to seek some labor jobs, it's, it's the same that, that we are going through. And young people like us should change it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim Lakai and Mr. Santosh Shah for being with us today and sharing with us your insightful thoughts and ideas. Thank you for watching us. We look forward to your feedback. Our email address is youthtya at the rate gmail.com. We hope to see you next week at the same time. Have a nice week. Namaste.